Now, Bragg urged this court, you, Judge Juan Mercan, and you did it, to front run the Supreme Court of the United States. Trump's defense, Your Honor, objection, that evidence can't come in, presidential immunity. And the government, no, it doesn't exist. It's not even a rule what they're talking about. In fact, we have case law that shows the exact opposite. It's ultimately up to the government to rebut that presumption. Where the presumption applies, at a minimum, the president must therefore be immune. Oh no, Alvin Bragg blown out. Alvin Bragg and Juan Mercan made a big mistake. They did not consider presidential immunity in the prosecution of Trump. And the Supreme Court said, you guys should have done that because immunity is something that is applicable to the presidency. Obviously, everybody knew this. The reason why they didn't want to consider it and allow it to be something that paused this underlying case is because they wanted a conviction against Trump. They were going to do everything that they could to get it. And now it's coming back to bite them in Alvin Bragg's booty. So we're going to talk about this motion. You can see it's a 55 pager submitted in the case by President Trump. So this is from his defense team, and it is a good one. We're going to go through it in detail today because I want to make sure this full thing is on the record. All right, Judge Juan Mercan. And remember the backdrop here is you have to submit a little permission slip to the judge. This judge, Judge Juan Mercan, is the same judge who made two donations to Joe Biden. They were small spite donations. And he did it the next day. Fired another one off. His daughter is somebody who raised $93 million for Democrats, has on her website that she works for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Daughter says, daddy doesn't like Trump. Trump's tweets on podcasts when she's ranting about what she does to help Democrats. So all of this is now going to the same judge. They asked for a permission to submit this full brief. Judge Mercan has granted that. Now we start. All right, Judge Juan. So they're asking the guy who wrecked the case to reconsider or to do something about him wrecking the case. You see how that works? So we'll see if he's really amenable to those arguments. Finally, Rob, get started. President Trump, Juan, respectfully submits this motion to dismiss the indictment and to vacate the jury's verdicts based on immunity. We know that case came back down from the Supreme Court of the United States, and you need to consider that now. They tell Judge Juan and Attorney Bragg, they say, all right, buckos, no president of the United States has ever been treated as unfairly and unlawfully as Bragg has acted towards President Trump, all done in connection with a biased investigation. This extraordinarily delayed charging decision that they dragged out forever, and this baseless prosecution that gives rise to this very motion, saying these politically motivated actions are prime examples of the type of factional strife that the framers intended to avoid. It's one-sided lawfare that risks enfeebling the presidency and our very government. And the establishment of an executive branch, if you do it this way, that's going to cannibalize itself. Now, previously abstract risks, these fanciful ideas that there would be some local hostilities that would give rise to the targeting of federal officials has happened now. Now, it's part of a concocted, concerted, but unsuccessful effort to stop and hinder Trump's leading campaign in the presidential election. And it's to also restrict his constitutionally protected speech, not only Trump's speech, but our speech as well. Now they continue with this very old and important adage that you have surely heard says, haste makes waste. If you go fast, you screw up. It's an old adage and it survived so long because it's right so often. Coming from the seventh circuit, they're quoting them. They say like special counsel, Jack Smith, who's not even a lawful special counsel because he's illegally appointed and unlawfully appropriated. Like him though, Bragg, Alvin, is insisting and did insist on proceeding on a highly expedited basis. He wanted to go fast. Why? Well, election interference. They had a mission. It was driven by President Biden and his associates like Matthew Colangelo. Rather than wait for the Supreme Court's guidance, no, they could have waited because the Supreme Court was deciding all of this in real time. The prosecutors scoffed with hubris at President Trump. <laughs> Immunity for you? And insisted on rushing to trial despite the fact that no court has ever been faced with the question of a president's immunity from prosecution. Never come up before. Andy McCarthy did some research on that. You know who supported him? Turley. You know who supported him? Rifkin Jr. You know who supported him? Many others like Elizabeth Price Foley. So there's a lot of details here. No president has been criminally prosecuted before. Now Bragg urged this court, you Judge Juan Mercan, and you did it, to front run the Supreme Court of the United States. Love that line. You tried to get ahead of them. It's like, okay, you know mom's coming home, so you have to get this done before mom gets home. Because if mom caught you doing this, she would stop you and you'd be in big trouble. But if you get it done before mom comes home, then uh, maybe you get away with it. Maybe mom doesn't know. Maybe it's all done. You say it's all closed, whatever. So no, but Bragg urged this court, right? They were trying to conspire to deviate past the Supreme Court. And they did it not on some sneaky case, on a federal constitutional issue. First of its kind novel with grave implications 
implications on how the federal government works and how the balance it exists between the state and federal officials. But guess what, judge? He's really talking to the judge also. He's not going to condemn or scold the judge here. He'd love to. We'll do it for him. But he would love to. He can't. But he's going to come down on Alvin Bragg. The record's clear, judge. The judge allowed the record to happen this way. Says that Bragg was wrong. Very wrong. Now, be that as it may, your honor now has the authority to address these injustices. <laughs> we'll see if he does, since he allowed them to happen. But the court, okay, you have the authority, but guess what? Doesn't matter if you think you don't or whatever. You have no discretion here. In fact, it is now mandatory. You are duty bound to do so because the Supreme Court said so. Under the Supreme Court case that said that Trump does have immunity, Bragg violated the presidential immunity doctrine and the supremacy clause. Well, how'd he do that? Well, he relied on evidence, all of it relating to Trump's official acts. We covered the whole trial here at length, thanks to our friend Matthew Russell Lee, inner city press presiding, who gave us some very good details on what was going on inside there. And we know they were talking all about stuff that Trump was talking about in 2017 and 18. Who was the president in 2017 and 18? Donald Trump. They knew that. Trump said, I was the president. I have immunity. And they said, no, you don't. We're going to trial. Trump said, this is unprecedented. Okay. This is unfounded. Never happened before. Much of the unconstitutional official acts evidence that they introduced unlawfully concerned actions taken pursuant to the core executive power where absolute immunity applies for this bucket on the right. Overall, the impermissible official acts evidence included a bunch of stuff. Here is what the president does. President Trump's private conversations with the White House comms director, Hope Hicks. Observations by the director of Oval Operations, Madeleine Westerhout, about Trump's preferences and practices in the Oval Office. With respect to national security matters, also talked about Air Force One and Marine One, as well as secure calls in the White House Situation Room, all came in as evidence. Allegations of conversation about the pardon power. Official communications by President Trump using a Twitter account that was the formal channel of communication. All of it came in as evidence. Now, because of the implications for the institution of the presidency allowing this to happen, the use of official acts evidence was a structural error in this case. Should have never come in. All of that bucket should have been left out, long out. These transgressions from Juan and Bragg resulted in the type of deeply prejudicial error that strikes at the core of the government's function cannot be addressed through this harmless error analysis. Now, even if it were otherwise, which they'll probably try to say, Bragg's proof could not even withstand that test if we had to use that test. This case turned on a single witness, convicted perjurer called Michael Cohen, clearly concerned about the credibility of Cohen and their other financially motivated star witness called Stormy Daniels, that porn star. One is a serial perjurer with an axe to grind, that's Cohen. The other is hellbent on recasting her fictitious narrative, that's Stormy, in an even more nefarious terms. So they concocted Bragg's office a dubious theory of a 2018 pressure campaign by President Trump so that they could falsely claim that people on the jury, that there were people like Hope Hicks, comms director for Trump, and Madeline Westerhouse, the Oval Office Director of Operations, provided some measure of corroboration for testimony. And the prosecutors themselves even struggled to credit them. So they say, listen, at the bottom, Your Honor, Judge Murkan, the pressure campaign theory that Bragg's office tried to concoct was done to assign criminal motives to Trump, saying he orchestrated this. And they were related to actions that he took as commander in chief. All of that goes into the final bucket. The decision, which means absolute immunity, or at least if not that, arguably in the middle bucket. So the decision in Trump, which is the Supreme Court immunity case, forecloses inquiry into those motives. That was a part of the decision in the Supreme Court case. And the objective inquiry required by the Supreme Court places this evidence squarely within the category of the official acts. And that means unreviewable discretion of the president. Now the Supreme Court decision, as they said, applies equally to all occupants of the Oval Office, regardless of politics, policy, or party. So in order to vindicate the presidential immunity doctrine, Judge Juan, and to protect the interests that were articulated by the Supreme Court, the jury's verdicts must be vacated. All 34 of them need to go bye-bye, and the indictment has to be dismissed. Let's, before we even get to the trial, talk about pre-trial litigation and how bad this entire case was. All right, Judge, on February 28th, as you know, the Supreme Court granted cert to Trump versus United States. So February 28th, Supreme Court was saying, we have a, an issue we need to decide. Question, whether and if so, to what extent does a former president, aka Trump, have presidential immunity? It's involving official acts. Now, less than a week before that was granted, Bragg had already previewed their intention before the trial was getting started to talk about that pressure campaign, saying President Trump enacted some pressure campaign while he was in office in 2018. So Bragg starts it, then Supreme Court grants cert. We're going to talk about your president.
presidency, Supreme Court says, we're going to consider how this works. So then on March 7th, just six business days after the Supreme Court's decision to grant cert, Trump filed a motion to exclude that. He says, you can't do that. You can't talk about official acts, Bragg. So to be clear, Bragg goes first, then SCOTUS goes second, says, we're going to accept it. Thanks for coming in. Then Trump responds and says, no, you can't say that back. You can't actually talk about official acts because the Supreme Court is going to answer the question about whether I have immunity about those acts. They asked specifically for an adjournment, just like they were granted in Judge Chutkin's case, so that the Supreme Court could first address the issue in Trump. And again, the reason Chutkin granted the adjournment, she did not want to do it, man, but she had to, because that's how it works. And Murkan didn't do it, so he done goofed big time. The president requests in his filing, Your Honor, we would like to have an evidentiary hearing outside the presence of the jury. And they argued the court should, quote, preclude evidence of Trump's official acts at trial based on presidential immunity, which is basically exactly what the Supreme Court said. So it's like, man, swish on that one. Well done, fellows and ladies. All got that submitted. And that's basically what the Supreme Court said exactly, because that's just how it works. Now, President Trump specifically challenged the admissibility of the evidence. So before the trial started, Trump was objecting. They overruled him and let it all in. This is why it's important to object and to anchor in your positions early. 2018, they wanted, you can't use these social media posts where Trump used his Twitter, now X account, don't ban us Elon, which was an official communications channel during his presidency. They used all of it, all of the president's official communications. No, SCOTUS said that's the final bucket. President Trump's public statements came in on official premises and during media appearances. We want to keep that out too. They want to keep out documentary evidence, including official forms, Form 278E, which Trump's team filled out in 2017, which is a financial disclosure report, which President Trump signed in May 2018, and they submitted to the Office of Government Ethics. So Trump was complying with the ethics, right? And they submitted that. Testimony at trial relating to official acts, including Hope Hicks and Michael Cohen. And Michael Cohen, hopefully they tell us, even admitted, I'm sure they will, that there was legal work that he did for President Trump when he was the president, not in 2016 before he became the president. Now, as to the timing of the motion, President Trump pointed to the Supreme Court. They said they just accepted our case. And so you should stop all of this or you can continue the trial, your choice. You can stop the case if you really need this evidence, let it go up to the Supreme Court. They'll come back out, tell you what to do about this evidence. Then we can evidentiary hearing and go through it. But if they had to do all of that, well, they wouldn't have gotten their verdict. So they just did it and they included the evidence as well, which is also very problematic. So they just included most of this as we'll see. So in March, 2024, Bragg argued that the motion was untimely and was meritless. So you cannot, he says, too late, trial's right about to start. And also you don't have immunity anyways. Bragg said that there's no categorical bar to using evidence of immunized conduct when the trial involves non-immunized conduct. So Bragg's trying to make a distinction that's not in law. And the evidence at issue was not constituting official acts. And so the court denied, right? The court agreed with Bragg. And the court noted, right? This is where Mercon screwed up big time, the judge. The court declined to consider, didn't even consider whether the doctrine of presidential immunity precludes the introduction of evidence of purported official presidential acts in a criminal proceeding. Now, on April 10th, President Trump filed a verified appeal on the same day, they denied an application for a stay. In its opposition filing, we have redacted items here, I don't even know what it is, but Bragg claimed that so on and so on, and Bragg argued that so on and so on, and finally Bragg said, <laughs> all of these claims have now been explicitly rejected by the Supreme Court. I don't know what those claims were, but Bragg's probably whining about something. But on May 23rd then, the first department, the appellate level, concluded that prohibition does not lie with respect to Trump's immunity argument. So the preclusion of the evidence is not going to be applicable to Trump. So the evidence comes in. In language that has now been contradicted and destroyed by the Supreme Court, the first department suggested that a direct appeal after the case is over would protect Trump's rights. On April 15th, the first day of jury selection, and Trump's team is making these objections noted, etched in there. Bragg made an offer of proof. So the judge said, well, what kind of evidence do you have about this pressure campaign? And the first category, they said, well, here's the evidence, Your Honor. We're going to show in trial, because Trump is now trying to keep this out. So they said, well, what kind of evidence are you going to show? And let me decide. So Bragg came out. Now, the first category of evidence that was going to be this Trump's dangerous pressure campaign was tweets and communications with Michael Cohen by then President Trump, their quote. So Trump was president talking to his lawyer and tweets when he was president. Sounds like official. Those were communications also via Robert Costello. They said that this was a back channel communication with President Trump, which was also critical to maintain. Now, Bragg argued that these are Trump's own words publicly broadcasted, tweeted out for the world to 
democracy. And so Trump should not be able to prevent the jury from hearing them now. So in response, Trump's defense said, okay, well, we're gonna say this is immune. This is his official communication. This is an official presidential act. Bragg is even admitting. He sends it out for the world to see, like a president communicating to the public, which is an official thing that the president does. So they said, oh, okay, well, we're gonna say that's immune. Like you can't use that because that's immune. And SCOTUS is gonna decide it right now, so you should probably stop what you're doing. But Judge Mercan said no. He said, if the argument is that tweets that Trump sent out while he was president cannot be used because they're an official presidential act, he says, I don't think so. It's going to be hard to convince me that something that he tweeted out to millions of people voluntarily cannot be used in court when it's not being presented as a crime. This is the judge reasoning. It's just being used as an act, something that he did, but we'll wait until we get that submission. Wrong. So his analysis is pretty wrong. So following the proceedings, Trump submitted a pre-motion letter saying, well, your honor, we're going to reiterate this. We're going to regurgitate this again. We have an evidentiary objection. That was an official act. Trump was communicating publicly through an official communication channel, which means he gets immunity for it. You don't get to go in there and cobble it up and decide what it is. The letter specifically objected to this form being submitted, objected to government exhibit 407 F and I. We also objected to any witnesses talking about Trump's official acts during the first term. The lawyers did a great job. On the issue of timeliness, Trump said, no, it's perfectly timely. Do you know why? Because a motion to preclude evidence is not a pretrial motion. Alvin Bragg was lying to you, Judge. You probably knew that, but you kind of entertained it. So a motion to preclude evidence can come up at any time. It's not a pretrial motion or something that is limited by those timelines. Now, Bragg also responded to that letter. And in that letter, they said, no, no, no. They said Trump had forfeited the presidential immunity argument. Sorry, Trump, you're too late. But they made no serious effort to defend their prior timeliness claim. So they dropped that. They're like, oh crap, he's right. Oops. So they conceded that Trump could make the appropriate objections during the trial. But nonetheless, Bragg, right? And prosecutors have a higher standard and duty of care. We know that they're political hacks, especially in the cases that we cover, but they are not supposed to be that way. So Bragg stubbornly insisted with tremendous and unwarranted arrogance, which is true. That's how they mostly are. And in great tension with positions taken by several Supreme Court justices just days later at oral argument, Bragg came out and said, presidential immunity does not exist at all. A lot of people said that because they're idiots. Shocking to me. We'd like, we had different judges and like Harvard people all over X. It was insane. They all got obliterated. There is no corresponding evidentiary privilege as well. And President Trump, they said, was not acting in an official capacity. So they lost on all those. Now, the court ruled on April 19th after Bragg made that absolutely arrogant and stubborn statement. The court ruled that its reasoning remains the same. Mercant says, that's brilliant analysis. I love that. Well done, Alvin. The court said, we are going to wait until trial and you can make your objections at that time. So if Bragg submits it, they can object and then the judge will decide. Now, both of you have already made your arguments in the letter. So the court will decide at the time of trial when the objections are made. So the matter is decided and will not be addressed any further. Okay. So Trump has made multiple objections now on the record and said, okay, we'll just keep objecting, I guess. And the judge just keeps kicking it down. So then trial starts. Defense counsel renewed the presidential immunity objection at trial multiple times, including right before Hope Hicks testimony. Now, I think the judge will say this because when we were covering the trial, reading through the transcripts here, we noticed that the judge would at times say things like specifically in the Stormy Daniels testimony. I can't believe the defense didn't object. And we're all sitting here. The defense did object like 15 times. Did you hear that, Your Honor? So the judge has conveniently forgotten some important components of the trial when it serves him well. So Bragg incorrectly responded that the rule of inadmissibility that Mr. Beauvais just described does not exist and is not a rule and claimed falsely that analogous case law showed the opposite. And so they're getting into it, right? When trial starts. Trump's defense, Your Honor, objection, that evidence can't come in, presidential immunity. And the government, no, it doesn't exist. It's not even a rule what they're talking about. In fact, we should have case law that shows the exact opposite. And the court, the judge says, you know, I agree with you. I believe I ruled on this as well. And so the objection is noted and the court said, I don't think you need to object as to each question. So this is what the defense is doing right now is they're papering the file because they know that the judge is going to come back and say, you guys didn't object to keeping this evidence out. They're saying, oh, we sure as hell did, brother. We have been objecting for months, multiple times. You have overruled us every time. And in addition, the Supreme Court granted cert and there was good cause for the timing of Trump's initial motion. Yeah. So during the testimony of former Trump organization controller, his name was Jeff McConney. So the government called McConney out. Defense objected. Your Honor, objection. We object to this witness. Why? Presidential immunity. Why? Well, because he's going to talk about form OGE form 2780. Here's what happened in court. Matthew Colangelo, Joe Biden's prosecutor who left the Joe Biden DOJ to come prosecute Trump, said, Your Honor, so for the same reasons I believe we briefed and argued previously, there is no evidentiary inadmissible 
disability doctrine for official acts just doesn't exist. And in any event, the regulations require the filing of the form for presidential candidates and candidates for federal office and for reasons including the purpose of ensuring compliance with conflict of interest laws. And so it is not a document entitled to any evidentiary exclusion at all. The form. Mercon says, I agree, Mr. Colangelo. Great job. Your Honor, the same objection as discussed last week, says Mr. Blanche, just continues to repeat it. So again, overruled. Court says, I agree. That was the wrong analysis, Matthew Colangelo. Got that one wrong. But you don't care because you're a hack prosecutor who just devoted to getting an outcome, regardless of what the law is. So then they brought in Hope Hicks. Now, Bragg used its subpoena power to require Hope Hicks, the White House Communications Director, Director of Strategic Comms, to testify about her time with Trump during his first term in office. At the start of Trump's term, Hicks joined the administration as Director of Comms. In that role, Hicks' responsibility included working to showcase President Trump's accomplishments and the agenda of the administration. In August 2017, she became the White House Comms Director. And between January and March, she worked in close proximity to the Oval Office. In fact, the transcripts say she spoke with President Trump every day. Sounds pretty official, huh? As the comms director, she was responsible for a bunch of stuff. Coordinating communication. She also was making sure that the principals of the agencies and the agencies themselves were prioritizing Trump's agenda and that we're all working together to maximize the impact of the positive messages. Trying to get out, share more of this with the American people to capitalize on these opportunities to show Trump in a good light, like a comms person should. Now, Hope Hicks testified about her official capacity communications with Trump and the press concerning a Wall Street Journal article that came into evidence at trial. You recognize this? Yeah. Hicks explained that the Wall Street Journal contacted either herself and another press communications team member prior to publishing the story. The article included two comments from a, quote, unidentified White House official. So Alvin Bragg brought this in. He elicited the identity of the White House official and asked Hicks the following. And as the communications director at the time, says the government, withdrawn, did you discuss this statement with Mr. Trump before it was issued? Oh, so responding officially to a statement. Yes, I did. Hicks testified that after the article was published, she spoke to President Trump about, quote, how to respond to the story, how he would like a team to respond to the story. In January 2018, the organization known as Common Cause also made a complaint about Trump and Cohen to the FEC. In mid-February, Hicks spoke with President Trump about a New York Times article that included a statement from Cohen. Cohen saying that he had, in fact, made this payment without Mr. Trump's knowledge. During testimony at trial, Hope Hicks testified, she said, President Trump was saying he spoke to Michael and that Michael had paid this woman to protect him from false allegation and um, that, you know, Michael felt like it was his job to protect him and that's what he was doing. And he did it out of the kindness of his own heart. He never told anybody about it, you know? And he was continuing to try to protect him up until the point where he felt he had to state what was true in the story. And he wanted to know how it was playing, said Trump. And just my thoughts and opinion about the story versus having the story, a different kind of story before the campaign, had Michael not made that payment. So Trump is saying, okay, so there's this story floating around and what's your thought on it? Prior to trial, Alvin Bragg, quote, refreshed Hicks' memory about Karen McDougal, Droopy McDougal, who also had a claim against Trump. At trial, Bragg offered a text message exchange between Hope Hicks, the director of comms, and Madeline Westerhout, who was the Oval Office operations person, that included a message from Westerhout purporting to reflect a request from President Trump. Text, hey, the president wants to know if you called David Pecker again, the guy who worked from AMI, as you recall. Bragg also elicited testimony from Hicks about official capacity, right? This is her job. And she's saying the president, right? She's working for the president. Hey, Hope, did you talk to Pecker on behalf of the president again? And she's the, works for him. Hicks said, to be clear, I did speak to Mr. Trump. I was a communications director. This was a major interview. Yes, we just spoke about the news coverage of the interview and how it was playing out, as you do. Then, in addition to Hope Hicks, they brought out this other evidence. Now, again, we're asking ourselves each one of these subcategories, what bucket does this go in? Is this something that is absolutely unofficial, not presidential conduct at all, that if you criminalized it or made it the subject of a criminal prosecution, it would have no impact on the presidency at all, like it's so far removed? Is it questionable? So we start with presumptive. Is it absolute because it's codified and clear? Where does it fall? Does the president have the right to have a staff and communicate with them? And can that evidence be used against him at trial by a hack prosecutor? Supreme Court says no. They say, you guys did that though. You brought in Madeline Westerhout. She was special assistant to the president. She served as an aide to Trump, variety of titles in the first term, but then she became the director of Oval Office and then special assistant. But like what they did with Hope Hicks, Alvin Bragg used his subpoena authority to require Madeline Westerhout to testify. Government prosecutors elicited this information from Madeline when she came in to testify, asked him, what was President Trump got her to say this? Said that President Trump liked speaking with people in person or on the phone. Sounds like presidential duties. President Trump, she 
talked about, took a lot of calls each day. As early as six in the morning, the man's unbelievable, until late into the night, wasn't in bed by eight like Joe. The complicated process for calling the president of the United States, she talked about, included calls that were more secure that might need to be on a secure line, conducted via the Situation Room, so she set those up. She said Trump did not use computer or email in the White House. He liked hard copy documents. Trump also, she testified, liked to read, moved his working space into a room off of the side of the Oval Office, which was really his working office because he wanted to keep the Resolute desk very pristine and kind of keep that more for meetings. President Trump used an organization system and brought a lot of papers and often brought things back and forth to his residence or Air Force One or Marine One. President Trump preferred to sign things himself, she said. Liked to use a Sharpie or felt tip pen. Typically read things before he signed them. Regarding social media, right, this is all official stuff. She's talking about what he does in the Oval Office. What does he do? How does he work? Got an organization system. All testimony. All should have been precluded. Regarding social media, Westerhout testified that Trump and Dan Scavino shared access to the real Donald Trump account. That's a lot of power. DNY Bragg said elicited that President Trump occasionally dictated posts to Westerhout and asked that President Trump's particular preferences for posting, right? So she testified about a lot of that. All of that came out. All of that was official act business. Never should have come in. Structural problems with the trial. How do you disentangle that from everything else she testified about? You can't. Bragg also elicited testimony from Westerhout. Talked about her extensive contacts with the Trump organization, who at Trump's direction while she was working there, she communicated with. For example, they offered an email exchange in January where Westerhout used her official email account to ask Rana Graf for contact information. She talked to people that Trump frequently spoke to. The president would ask her to initiate calls. And all of this, she testified after she had been recently been refreshed by Bragg, okay? So I love how they're including that because what that means is Bragg is bringing this out. It's his misconduct. He's asking about it. It's all official acts stuff. They also brought out testimony about Jack Smith's office and the congressional investigations and the pardon power. All of that stuff is presidential stuff. By the summer of 2017, the media had reported that Robert Mueller was conducting a far-flung and fruitless investigation into Trump, all related to Russia, Russia, Russia from 2016. In April 2018, the FBI executed search warrants that went after Michael Cohen. Then, between August and October, Cohen made false statements in private meetings and public testimony before the Senate and the House. At trial, Michael Cohen came in to testify, and he claimed that he lied to Congress because, quote, he was staying on Trump's message that there was no Russia, Russia, Russia. He also testified, right? So in other words, Cohen is talking about Trump's official presidential scandal. Cohen also testified that he felt that he needed what Ms. Hoffinger, the prosecutor, described as the power of the president to protect him because he lied to Congress, right? So again, president, president. So Bragg also elicited pardon-related testimony. In other words, the president is allowed to pardon everybody. You can't sit in judgment of him and you can't prescribe motives to the president. Oh, Trump was going to pardon you or pardon this. And in other words, the president is going to be penalized because you're now talking about his official powers. It's not appropriate at all. And of course, the Supreme Court agreed. Bragg also elicited this from Michael Cohen in an email that Robert Costello sent. Costello wrote to Michael Cohen an email in pertinent part saying, well, what you do next is for you to decide there, Michael. But if that choice requires any discussion with my friend's client, you have an opportunity to convey that this evening, but only if you decide. And they were talking about potential pre pardons or something, said Michael Cohen. And if they're talking about a pardon power, that directly implicates the president. You have to at least ask if that is protected by immunity. They didn't do that. Huge mistake. They also brought in testimony about Trump's response to FEC inquiries, more official business. On February 6th, Michael Cohen texted a reporter from the New York Times. He said, President Trump just approved me responding to the FEC complaint with a statement. February 6, 2018. See that date? Cohen texted a reporter that the president said, you can do some legal work helping me with my presidency. Respond responding to an FEC complaint. Please start writing and I will call you soon. Michael Cohen said that. Bragg offered evidence that Cohen's subsequent public statement about this, and they admitted that into evidence at trial. 2018 evidence. Jay Sekulow subsequently texted Cohen that President Trump says, thanks for what you do helping me deal with my presidency. At trial, Cohen explained that he was instructed by Mr. Trump to keep in touch with Jay because he was in contact with Trump. And Cohen opined that the text message referred to President Trump and that the statement that Cohen was putting out to the press was from him on the FEC. Official stuff. Cohen also testified that he spoke to AMI's chairman, David Pecker, about the FEC. Cohen testified he told Pecker that the matter was going to be taken care of and the person who's going to be able to do that is Jeff Sessions, another official person at the time. So the government elicited that Trump told Cohen that Sessions would address it. Official actions between the president and the attorney general at the time. Why did any of that come in? Shouldn't have. More evidence that should have been kept out. Bragg also offered evidence of five sets of posts from Trump's official actions. X 
account. In a first set of the Twitter posts dated April 21st, 2018, presidential communications, Trump criticized the New York Times for going out of their way to destroy Michael Cohen, trying to get him to flip. At trial, Hoffinger elicited that Cohen was raided by the FBI. Hoffinger also later showed 21 posts to Michael Cohen, who said that those posts were directed to me, saying, I have you, Michael Cohen said. Trump was posting to get me killed. Bragg also offered evidence about other communications between Cohen and Costello, all official stuff. In the email, Costello characterized the post as containing very positive comments about you. Cohen testified he interpreted the email to refer to communications from the president to the lawyer. He said, it let me know I was still important to the team to stay the course and that the president had my back. Now, with respect to the second set of the Twitter posts, Hoffinger also elicited testimony about Stormy Daniels. And through a series of leading questions, Hoffinger then basically testified that Stormy Daniels brought a defamation claim against Trump, which was dismissed by the court, right? And so all of that was probably not relevant, but the judge let it in. Now, Bragg also admitted the social media posts into trial over Trump's objection. You can't have those in. And they said it, it could. They said through the testimony of a paralegal who did not have firsthand knowledge. So they brought in just a paralegal from Bragg's office. And she says, I went and clipped these, as we remember. They say the fourth and fifth posts were later dated in August of 2018, again, during the presidency. If anyone is looking for a good lawyer, Trump said, I would strongly suggest you don't retain the services of Michael Cohen. The fifth post stated, I feel badly for Paul Manafort and his wonderful family. Justice took a 12-year-old tax case, among other things, applied tremendous pressure on Manafort. Unlike Cohen, he refused to break. Such respect for a brave man. Then they asked Cohen the following question. They said, Mr. Cohen, what if any effect did it have on you at the time to have, here you go, look at this, question from the prosecutor, to have the President of the United States tweeting this about you the day after you pled guilty. Cohen said it caused a lot of angst and anxiety. So they're constantly commenting on the presidency, right? Is the president not allowed to respond to attacks on his administration? Of course he is. So during the closing arguments, now with all of that evidence that should have been precluded that now has been included, they say the prosecutor repeatedly emphasized all of the inadmissible official acts testimony. In his closing arguments, he said Hope Hicks and Madeline Westerhout. These are people who said damaging and utterly devastating testimony. He called them critical pieces of the puzzle. Shouldn't have never had their testimony at all. He said they had no motive to fabricate anything. He described Hicks as Trump's own employees. He described Westerhout saying that Trump also submitted his own tweets. He said that Trump had a fascinating conversation with Hope Hicks, which we know was official. And at that point in the summation, he read Hope Hicks's testimony to the jury. He said that her communication as his official employee was devastating. He said it came from from Trump's own communications director. Immune! Mr. Steinglass revisited this towards the end. He said when the story finally broke in 2018, Trump explicitly told Ms. Hicks that it's better that the story came out now than before the election. Now regarding Trump's attack on Cohen, Steinglass said that Cohen's lies to Congress had to do with the Mueller investigation and the Russia probe. He argued that Cohen's, which were both related to Trump, he also argued that Cohen's public statement about the FEC was an effort to fall on the sword to protect the president. He made the explicit argument that Seculo was communicating with Cohen on behalf of President Trump. He said the substance of the calls between Cohen and Trump was basically, don't worry, I'm the president of the United States. There's nothing here. Everything's going to be okay. Stay tough. This is the prosecutor regurgitating what he thinks Trump was saying. Oh, basically, don't worry. I'm the president. I'm going to take care of you. Just lie. Keeps talking about the president. Why? Because he has the pardon power. So with respect to Trump's Twitter post, Steinglass also reminded the jury of Cohen's opinion that President Trump was communicating with him without picking up the phone directly to send a message to Cohen. Don't flip. Bragg also called attention to Trump's Twitter post here and linked the disclosure of the form that Trump signed. And then they incorrectly, in his closing arguments, said that the clear message from Trump's official act tweets was this, cooperate, you will face the wrath of Donald Trump. All in closing arguments. So we know that at any time, according to New York law, at any time after the rendition of a verdict of guilty, but before a sentence, what can the court do? The court court may, upon motion of a defendant, set aside or modify the verdict based on any ground, which if raised on appeal, would require a reversal in the next level court. Presidential immunity issue here warrants that, saying, as explained below, the Supreme Court held in Trump, prosecutors like Bragg and Jack Smith and Fannie cannot use evidence of a former president's official acts in a criminal prosecution. Can't do it. SCOTUS said so. The prohibition forbids the use of official acts evidence, even where the actus reus of the crime at issue is unofficial. The act. Presidential immunity is 
absolute with respect to the president's exercise of his core powers. You can't criminalize that because you're criminalizing a core power. That means that you're dividing by zero. Arising from the Constitution and is at least presumptive, which means you start with immunity, as to official acts within the outer perimeter of presidential powers, which is basically as broad as hell. Actions that are not palpably beyond a president's authority, meaning actually breaking the law beyond the presidential authority. So where presumptive immunity applies in that middle bucket, prosecutors bear the burden. There is a presumption. The prosecution, the government has to overcome and rebut that presumption to show that, nope, they shouldn't be in that bucket. We put them in the middle bucket. Trump has immunity. They have to come out and take it out of there and put it in a different one. We don't start in their bucket and move over here. By showing that a criminal prosecution involving evidence of an official act would pose no dangers to the intrusion on the executive branch. It is broad. But in this case, Bragg has waived the right to seek to rebut the official acts presumption because he rushed to trial over Trump's objection. The purpose of the doctrine is obviously to ensure that presidents can do their jobs. The Trump court at the Supreme Court level addressed this. They talked about the separation of powers concerns. What happens if a president's official acts are criminalized by other entities? In this state level prosecution, there are concerns about the institution of the presidency being dumped over by Alvin Bragg. And so the only thing that we can do here, because this has been such a devastating structural error, the only remedy is to dismiss this case. They tell us the Supreme Court held in Trump, presidential immunity is designed to protect the office of the presidency. Bragg made many bad arguments and got official acts evidence in, but you can't do that because the Trump court broke immunity into two broad categories, core powers where absolute immunity applies and outer perimeter official responsibility immunity, which is presumptive. For the official acts outer perimeter, you're entitled to at least presumptive. Now the Trump court did not decide whether the outer perimeter test must be absolute or whether presumptive immunity is sufficient and instead remanded this down because we're going to go back down and see how it goes. It's ultimately up to the government to rebut that presumption. Where the presumption applies at a minimum, the president must therefore be immune. Oh no, Alvin Bragg blown out. Here though, any efforts by Bragg to rebut the presumption, he can't do that now. It's untimely. This is so because questions about whether the president may be held liable must be addressed at the outset of the proceeding. So you can't go unring this bell. Having rushed this case to trial, can't rebut the presumption now. While these issues were under review from the Supreme Court, we told you to slow down. Bragg should not be permitted now to try to clean up his mess. The harm resulting from Bragg's actions is irreparable. Now, future presidents will be unduly cautious. The damage has been done. Under these circumstances, the only remedy is dismissal. And even if this court is inclined to address this by allowing them to try to rebut this presumption, can't do that. Court made clear, courts cannot dig into a president's motives. It's from the Supreme Court in the opinion explicitly. Such an inquiry would risk exposing everybody to attack because they would just say, you got a bad motive. Now, the justifying purposes of the presidential immunity doctrine are recognized in Trump. Here's where they went bad. Bragg literally violated the Constitution by allowing this stuff to happen. All of Hicks' testimony about 2018 is entitled to absolute immunity. You can't have testimony from former advisors probing an official act. That's ridiculous. All of it has to go. White House comms director Hope Hicks, she was a key subordinate of Trump. President can't execute every single law alone. So his conversations with Hicks involved efforts by the president to supervise someone who was wielding executive power on his behalf. That is from his Article 2 powers. Trump relies on the Constitution. He has interactions with his comms director. And so he's entitled to immunity for those conversations. Now, because Trump's convos were based on core authorities, presidential immunity is absolute. We don't need a further inquiry. We don't need an evidentiary hearing at all. Similarly, Hicks was talking to the media, talking about an FEC inquiry, talking about Michael Cohen, talking about speaking to the American people. That is all well within the presidential duties. In fact, in 2018, Trump was working to communicate with the media as president about all of these issues. Trump was providing guidance and information to Hicks so she could communicate these things to the public. Now, the testimony concerned efforts by Trump to work with Hicks to recognize a long known recognized presidential power. It's called the bully pulpit. In a Clinton case, the Supreme Court recognized that statements by various persons authorized to speak to the president during the presidency arguably may involve conduct within the outer perimeter of the president's official responsibilities. So it counts. Clinton did it. Now, even if the court had strained to give Bragg the benefit of applying only presumptive immunity rather than absolute, you cannot go into the president's motives. Courts cannot do that. Paula Jones alleged that 
that President Clinton, through his White House aides, did a bunch of stuff. We know Clinton was gross. Rather, what matters for the purpose of presumptive immunity is whether a criminal prohibition would intrude on the presidency. Obviously, that would happen. If you criminalize this conduct, you mean Trump can't talk to his comms director? Is that what you're saying? So obviously that can't apply. Now, they say recognizing Trump and his conversations with Hope Hick, we say all those should be protected. And so they should have been barred from using her testimony at all. There was absolute immunity. They done goof. Same story with Madeleine Westerhout. Okay, she was a loyal White House aide and the assistance of close aides is necessary. Even Elena Kagan, a Supreme Court judge, talked about this in one of her law review articles. Oh, Elena Kagan. But Bragg forced Westerhout to provide details of how Trump literally operated the executive branch, literally. How does he run his White House? Talked about national security matters. Talked about observations she made sitting outside the Oval Office. Question to her. Madeline, did you also make an effort to learn about Trump's preferences by observing him while you were sitting in the Oval Office? This invasive and compelled testimony included information about Trump's official capacity work, his habits, his relationships, his social media. Government asked her about Trump's transportation of documents, talking about calls about secure lines in the Twitter account, all the things. Now, her description of all this is she was talking about core powers of the commander in chief. And so all of that entitled to at least presumptive immunity. It's clearly within the outer perimeter, but none of this would be able to be rebutted by the prosecutors. You should have addressed this before, judge. You didn't do it. They also tried to get in Trump's statements, as we know. During discussions related to President Trump's Twitter account, Supreme Court said context can make clear that social media accounts can purport to speak for the government. So even though it was a personal Trump account, like they had the personal kind of branding behind it, it can be official. President Trump used that account as one of the official main vehicles for conducting official business. In addition to the appearance of the account and the official manner in which he was using it, he also used a White House employee to help him operate it. Scavino, the White House director of social media, works for the White House, employed by the executive branch, were allowed to use it. But Bragg relied on false opinions from Cohen and Daniels to suggest that they were tweets directed at them rather than what they were objectively. They were talking to the American people about matters of public concerns and attacks on the White House. The opinions of Cohen and Daniels are entitled to no weight on any of this. They don't matter at all. It's about whether Trump has immunity. It's not overcome because Stormy Daniels got scared or Michael Cohen says we were under attack. Suddenly that breaks immunity? No. Hoffinger used Cohen to say that I was under attack. Hoffinger also, the prosecutor, emphasized the official nature of the public communications, saying what effect did this have, Cohen, having the president of the United States saying this about you? Which he's allowed to say. It's official from the president. Now, while that timing's undisputed, so too should the authority of the president of the United States to comment on and criticize federal prosecutors. That's what he's entitled to do. In other words, like other official acts that they use, Trump's Twitter posts fall well within the core authority of the nation's chief executive. The court said they have power to do this and Clinton was alleged to have authorized White House personnel and a private attorney to talk about allegations by Paula Jones and other things and said those conducts may be within the outer perimeter of the president's responsibility, right? The president has to maintain the credibility of the office. You're a high profile person. You got to deal with that stuff. So the only evidence that they would have to rebut that there is at least a presumptive outer perimeter are lay witness opinions from Cohen and Daniels. But again, that would go into Trump's motivations and you're not allowed to do that. So they also talk about Trump's official acts in relation to the FEC stuff. Cohen testified that President Trump told him that an FEC inquiry would be taken care of by Jeff Sessions. Whether that's true or not, it's about the president. Assuming this conversation happened, which we don't even concede, Cohen's testimony included information about Trump's conclusive and preclusive authority. And in other words, the president has the power to talk to his attorney general and to his lawyer. He's immune for that. You can't ask what the conversation was for. Why were they meeting? Were they meeting to conspire? Is he allowed to meet with his AG? Yeah. Is he allowed to meet with his lawyer? Yeah, it's immune. As in Trump, Bragg suggested that Trump spoke to attorney general for an improper purpose. You can't read that. Sorry, can't read into his mind. And they also talked about congressional investigations. They say this official acts evidence came in. Cohen sought to justify his perjury on the Robert Mueller stuff by saying he was going to be on team Trump, that Cohen was seeking the power of the president to protect him. And so he needed to get under Trump's good side, which is why he lied. And similarly, Trump had the form that they wanted to get admitted, even though it was an official form. So use of official acts evidence also happened in the grand jury proceedings. So they also violated this during the grand jury. Obviously, we can't see this because there's some redactions there because it's a grand jury, which is secretive. But the official acts evidence was also presented to the grand jury. They can't see that. Court said you're immune. And so it requires a vacating of the verdict. The trial in this case, they say, to put it mildly, was similarly tainted. In light of the federal constitutional doctrine that came down from 
SCOTUS, the jury's verdict here cannot stand. The Supreme Court does not allow for overwhelming evidence or harmless error. These are institutional issues. The verdicts reflect a threat to the principles articulated by the Supreme Court. And in any case, because of the peculiar constitutional concerns, these are not harmless error and presidential immunity errors are never harmless. You can't just write this one off. These are critical issues. Here, Bragg wrongfully and unconstitutionally forced President Trump to litigate official acts at trial. They did it proudly. They did it unapologetically. They did it in a manner that speaks to the political motivations driving the elected local officials responsible for this prosecution. For example, referring to the contested official acts evidence now plainly subject to the Supreme Court, Bragg promised the appeals court that it planned to offer evidence of President Trump's supposed blankety blank blank. The heck is that? Now that is exactly what happened to this trial in violation of Trump. Cohen's testimony was the only connection of Trump to the charged crime. His multiple felonies, including fraud, cannot be overlooked in this analysis. The case was less than overwhelming. Based on Cohen's plea, a federal judge concluded that Cohen lied again in pleading guilty. Bragg relied on Cohen's claims, and that's all. They conceded they made no effort to present any information from Alan Weisselberg at all. Given the resources, it's only reasonable to confirm and to believe that Weisselberg's recollection is not consistent with Cohen's. And Cohen's testimony was tenuous at best. But Cohen's testimony is terrible. He claimed that Weisselberg turned around during the meeting to relay information to Trump, but that he was not even a direct participant. Cohen also falsely claimed that there was a scheme in the Oval Office on February 8th about recurring payments, but then he said later, please remind me of the monthly amount, right? So Cohen's testimony was inconsistent. Now, Ms. Hoffinger repeatedly asked Cohen to describe the substance of a telephone call with Trump seven years before the trial started. Given the numerous reasons that Cohen had to be in contact with Trump, toll records about those calls do not corroborate the false and salacious details that Cohen attributed. This reality came to pass during the trial when the defense demonstrated that Cohen lied emphatically about having discussed the details with Trump. We remember that phone call with Keith Schiller. He said, I talked to Trump about this whole deal right then. Turns out, no, Cohen was calling Schiller because some punk teenager was harassing him. Through this false testimony, Cohen again lied, demonstrated again. Little more than a prosecutorial parlor trick has no weight in your analysis. Now, they also tried to corroborate and rehabilitate this liar, but Cohen lied to the jury several times about the call. He claimed the recording ended because there was an incoming phone call, but the call demonstrates that Cohen did not answer the call. It went straight to voicemail, so that's not why the recording ended. The call also isolated by Hoffinger in the phone records went to a different physical cell phone device with a different IMEI number than the device that Cohen claimed. So again, we had questions about the audio and he said, no, it's raw. I didn't do anything with it. So it came from a different phone or voicemail came from something different. He didn't answer it. He said he did. When the September recording was cut off, President Trump was in the middle and the process of asking Cohen to quote, check on details that were not captured in the audio file. That's why they cut it off. On cross-examination, Cohen tried to explain that away by claiming falsely. He said, I used the word check because we needed to do it by check. Finally, even if all of the problems with the recording could not be ignored, which they could be ignored, Bragg's theory of the substance of the discussion did not corroborate Cohen's testimony. Bragg argued that the recording related to Karen McDougal, Droopy, it had nothing to do with Cohen's payment at all. And so the case was flawed. Also by the evidence, the evidentiary weaknesses were exacerbated by the fact that Bragg hid the ball about the theory that they could put to the jury until they submitted their proposed jury instructions. One federal election campaign act, one was about a tax theory under New York law, and then the other was business records theory. So there was no evidence whatsoever that anyone but Michael Cohen knew about the contents of the records that he submitted. No evidence at all. There's no evidence to support any conclusion that there was an election conspiracy. Pecker testified the records were not false, and so none of those boxes could have been checked, and they needed this evidence in order to make their case. They brought in all of this official act stuff because they couldn't make their case without it. They sought to bolster perjurer Cohen to address the glaring holes in their case. That's why they brought it in. They relied on Hope Hicks to argue that Trump was aware of the payments, but that's not all. They say that Bragg presented Westerhout's testimony to falsely detail their bogus charges that would have escaped them otherwise. And so their own closing arguments illustrate it all. Steinglass referred to Hicks and Westerhout employees as providing damaging, utterly devastating testimony. It's called them critical pieces to the puzzle. Couldn't have got it without them. Called attention to Trump's own tweets. And so it had a real causal effect here. The jury listened to this evidence. They cannot disregard it. And so as was evident, this matters. It was not harmless error. And so for the foregoing reasons, whew, they say this court should dismiss the indictment and vacate the verdicts, all 34 of them. Signed by these two amazing attorneys, Todd Blanche, shout out, Emile Beauvais, shout out. Outstanding work, gentlemen. Submitting that to Judge 
Juan the Khan Mercan in New York, arguing that Trump's presidency entitles him to official immunity. And much of the evidence in this trial belongs in this bucket. And if it's not in this bucket, it's arguably in this bucket. But the time to have the argument about where this evidence should belong has now expired. They could have waited, but we're going to be here continuing to cover it anyways. And so once Bragg submits his response, Trump will very likely have a reply and we'll be unpacking all of it. And so my friends, thank you for joining us as our coverage continues. Wherever it is you're watching this, we'd absolutely love it if you subscribed. And it'd be amazing if you invited somebody that you know in your life who you think might get some value out of the work that we do here and have some fun as we go through this madness. And of course, we look forward to seeing you back here on the next one.